Hi, I'm Billy and welcome to The Promising Creative. Is this thing okay? Are we good to go? Um, so welcome to the next issue or next edition of our podcast. I don't know if I'm going to say Emma. I'm just going to say Emma. How would you, we had this conversation, but how do you want me to well, say Well, my full name is Emma Louise Tallulah Boynton, <laughs> which is a wonderful, I think, porn star sounding name. So if you want to address me by Emma Louise Tallulah Boynton every time, you're welcome say, to. But Emma. Emma is fine. Yeah. Which leads us on quite nicely, actually. Um, because obviously there's a, the, all the chats that you do are based around sex and you're yes. probably like, okay, Billy, obviously. Um, I guess the first thing that I want to know is how did that even begin to be a thing? How long do we have? We're going to be here a while. We have ages. We have a call in America to do, but <laughs> okay. we have like, just sort of like, just I'll give you the, I'll give you the high. into it. I'll yeah. give you the high rub. So I actually used to work in news and current affairs. Um, I thought I, I was always in politics. I then was running a creative production agency called Her Hustle. So if you had said to me two years ago that you will be focusing your kind of media and journalism on sex, I would have laughed you out the room. It just like wouldn't have ever occurred to me. But during the pandemic, I started sex therapy personally. And that came about because I was at a dinner party with a group of strangers and we were talking about sex as you do. And I relayed to this group of strangers that I actually didn't really enjoy sex that much. I hadn't been able to orgasm and partnered sex for years. I didn't feel myself, I didn't think I was like particularly sexual. And two people at the table were really shocked and were like, wait, what? And one of them said to me, it turns out, sorry, both of them had been, had seen the same sex therapist and had since become evangelicals <laughs> for the cause and said, everyone needs to do sex therapy. It is transformative. And basically said, do it. I'm, and I thought, fuck it, why not? Can I swear? Is that right? Yeah, you can um, say whatever you want. Uh, so I thought, why not? I'll, I'll do it. And actually at that time I was working with Charmaine Reed on the stack. Okay. Um, so I was part of their editorial team setting up the, uh, that, that new platform. And she said, she was like, this would be so good for content. Like, can you write this as a column? So I ended up starting doing sex therapy and writing a column about it called Conversations with My Sex Therapist, a genius title, shout out to Charmaine for that. And I kind of went into sex therapy thinking like, I mean, the first thing I said to my sex therapist was, I'm broken. I don't really work sexually. Like I don't feel like a sexual person and I don't, I didn't really care. I didn't feel like it was something that was part of my life. I just kind of got used to that. And part of that was I grew up with a really bad eating disorder as so many women do. I was really anorexic and I was really badly bulimic for years. And it was one of those things which I hadn't really, I thought I was kind of over it and it was something in the past. And I think I was in massive denial. And then the pandemic really highlighted that I really wasn't. And I was still kind of using bulimia as my coping mechanism. And the reason I bring that up is that it was, it had meant that my relationship to my body was a really, really bad one. And it was really hard to enjoy sexual pleasure because I was so used to seeing my body as a source of pain rather than pleasure. And so in the course of doing sex therapy, I kind of unpacked all like, just all these like layers of, how toxic my relationship to my body still was, how that had shaped my relationship to sex, how sexual assault had really shaped my relationship to sex. So many things that I kind of had just not really acknowledged the impact they were having on my life in a significant way. And I, I mean, in the end, it was transformative. It was, I was never bulimic again after doing sex therapy. So it ended up being really transformative in that it totally reshaped my relationship with my body. And don't get me wrong, I still really struggle with body image issues. I think most people, most women mm. particularly do. But it reframed my relationship to my body and it reframed my relationship to sex. I, My friends at the time kind of laughed at me because they said, uh, they were like, why are you doing sex therapy? You're single, you're not having sex and we're in a pandemic. Um, I did sex therapy <laughs> on, on Zoom. And I was like, mm. yes, I know that. But you're really, what I learned doing it is your relationship to sex isn't just about fucking and who you're fucking. It's so much about your relationship to your body and about self-pleasure and like understanding what feels good. And that's like through masturbation. But I think it's also just genuinely the relationship, the kind of foundational relationship you have with your body. So I tell this backstory because I found that process fundamentally transformative um, in my life. And it occurred to me that it was so bananas that something that is universal as sex and how like, you know, it feeds into so many aspects of our life that we don't have more open conversations about it. Cause I think sex is everywhere. Like it's, you know, so rife in marketing, so many TV shows about sex. But I think often the way sex is 
discussed and presented is in such a kind of reductive and often kind of like quite um not stereotype what's the word very reductive and kind of idealized way or it's seen purely through the prism of porn and for me being in the sex therapy room I'd had these really in-depth and a little analytical discussions about sex my relationship my relationship to my body and I was like we need to have more of this like we need to talk more vulnerably about sex we need mm. to be more comfortable talking about this sort of stuff and I then went on and created I was running so I, I with her hustle I've been running events I'd always done podcasting that sort of thing and I thought I got um, asked to do some events for the Edition Hotel and they were like kind of what, whatever you want to do like you like lead, lead the way on this one I was like great let's do one let's do an event around sex and see if I can kind of translate some of the stuff that we I talked about in sex therapy and mainly because I wanted more people to have access to the sort of conversations and learnings I'd had in the sex therapy room because they'd been so transformative for me I thought god surely they can be transformative for other people too I had no idea if, some, if anyone would turn up. I had no idea whether it would be something that people would actually want to speak about, let alone be in a room full of people and do. Um, so launched the event. That was in October um, of last year, I think. And it has been a sellout event series since launch. It's expanded and gone into loads of different things. I've seen some of that yeah. on uh, and some of the conversations that happen. And they're good. Like... I think even for me, it's been a bit like, I think as you're a bit from a different generation as well, you can be a bit tabooy about it. And Imagine I know, my parents. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like I think my ex-partner is very open. Mm -hmm. And sometimes like you're a bit like, oh my God, <laughs> that actually gets head. And you're like, okay, yeah. I don't really know where I'm going to put my face. But after yeah. a while, it becomes quite, quite natural to hear. Yeah. I, and I think for me, like when... So you've gone through this journey and, mm -hmm. and it kind of corrected some of the issues that you had, I guess. And For sure. that must be quite uh, like an eye-opening moment. It must be quite enlightening. We're like, shit, I've, this has been going on for all this time mm -hmm. and I've done this and it's made me feel much better about myself. Totally. I, I think, and I think that's why it made me so <clears throat> like intent upon... I wanted other people to... We know that so many women have been sexually assaulted. So many women have had eating disorders. So I was like, I surely cannot be alone in, in kind of having felt the way I did about sex. And I think doing sex talks made me realize I really wasn't. And it kind of breaks my heart, but it's also quite galvanizing in that I started sex therapy saying I'm broken. And I felt, I felt that I just, that it was something wrong with me. I didn't like sex. And that was something that I was defunct in some way. And I had so much shame around my body and around sex as a result of that. And so many women have said to me since starting sex talks, I'm broken, have literally said the same words to me. And whether that's because they can't orgasm, they have a bad relationship to their body, they've had some like bad sexual experience. And so I think there is, it's just kind of, there's so much collective unspoken about anxiety around sex that isn't like the kind of glamorous, fun, saucy, salacious stuff to talk about, but I think is really important to help people have a more kind of fulfilling and happy um, relationship to their body first and foremost, and then relationship to sex. And I think Billy Quinlan, who set up Furley, who's a very good friend of mine, she always says, and it always sticks with me, that your relationship to sex and to your sexuality, it feeds into all aspects of your lives. It really affects your confidence, how mm. you go out into the world. Because ultimately we live, our, these bodies, that's, this is all we have. This is carries you around. So if you have a toxic relationship to your body, it's really hard then to go out into the world and be like super confident and happy and advocate for yourself. And I think that is, yeah, it's inextricably tied up to your relationship to sex. So I think if you can kind of address whatever um, issues you have in, in that way with your body, with your relationship to sex, it has such a huge knock on effect to the way you live your life in all kind of facets of your, of your being. Wow. That's quite intense. Yeah, so I feel for, like so kind of for like you, it's kind of now. yeah, no, it's so so like my last guest that I was speaking to, like she was saying that she has to learn to love herself mm. and being in love with herself, and mm. yours is so very hard. very similar. But yeah. you know, she she's not obviously doing it through sex; she does it yeah. in different ways, and yeah. she has to love. I guess we have to love ourselves, and that's and the journey that we have to go through. Yeah, and it's so hard. And I have to say, I am a big champion of the notion of body neutrality over body positivity because I think that anyone who's had an eating disorder it they I mean still now it is it won't be any it never goes away it's always like kind of there and you kind of learn to kind of cope with it better and I think as I said sex therapy was so important to me in, in being able to do that and to like end some particularly bad habits but I think that it puts a lot of pressure on us with the body positivity movement to be like I love my body it's so amazing it's so great and like most days some days I do and most days I just don't and I think 
it's quite nice to be able to just remove that pressure. I don't need to love it, but I'm really, I could, I'm always trying very hard not to hate it and not to be like, kind of feel like I'm at war with it. And I think by putting an onus on pleasure, whether that's through masturbation, whether that's through like the kind of sensuality, like my sex therapist said to me, I always say this, but she said to me, you need to put aside time to pleasure yourself, time for masturbation, time to seduce yourself. And I was like, seduce myself <laughs> but I think in a you know it's not just like get your vibrator and wank but it's like actually take the time to be sensual in your own company you're not waiting around for a partner or um you know whoever to 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 do that and I think that in itself was really important to me because it's actually it's about honoring your relationship to yourself yeah. and giving yourself the time to kind of luxuriate in your own sensuality and it's a way of demonstrating that you care about yourself and you can look after yourself so if you're not feeling confident about yeah. yourself and you're having that moment which yeah. i think we all do oh my god every day like it's quite normal <laughs> yeah how do you do you just put, like put yourself away or yeah. what do you do? What's I, that? How do you control? Like some people that suffer from like you're having a bad day. Yeah. You don't feel great. There's lots of shit going on. Yeah. People are doing your nothing. It's all a bit wild. Yeah. What do you do? Well, what what, what do you do to take it? To get away from it? Two strategies. So, well, I guess I have three. Um, first of all, conversations with friends or people who inspire me. It's always a for, for, for a surefire way to get me out of like whatever like funk I'm in. And I... I think a lot of my work is I work alone a lot and you just can get so into your head. And I think sometimes those, like when you get into that like pattern of like the more negative thoughts, that is because you're just spending a lot of time on mm. your own and you're like mm. lost in your own head. Yeah. And sometimes all it takes is picking up the phone and speaking to like, you know, I'm really lucky. I have lots of friends who also run businesses and work in creative industries, freelance and kind of get that, those struggles. So just a phone call with a friend, it changes everything. But then also when it comes to like particularly like body image and how I feel my body, I exercise religiously. I love it. And I've really tried to work hard to reframe my relationship to exercise from being punitive and about getting thin and looking a certain way to now being about how I feel in my body. And I feel like there's nothing more satisfying than feeling strong in your body and feeling mm. like you are in control of your body and you're really, you're working it hard. You're using it, um, pushing it to its max. So I do lots of like cycling and spinning and I run a lot. I'm part of a running group. And for me, that is just such a important part of like every day really of my life. So you, you train. I train like there's no tomorrow. And I also read a lot. But we'll go into reading. will come up a lot in this conversation, I'm sure. So we'll, I'll just say Part I read a lot through. for the escapism because I think that's the best way to get out of your head as well. But I'll put a pin in that because we'll, we'll return so to it. So you train? Do you meditate? Yeah. Do you do yoga? Uh, or is it I, just, is it just, do you hit, just hit it really hard? Yeah, I hit it really hard. And actually I do hit walls with that. And I recently, I said earlier, I just actually recovered from COVID. And I was training for a half marathon and I do tend to do extremes. I'm quite bad at being kind of moderate in things. So <laughs> I so start training for a half marathon it, and suddenly I'm doing like <clears throat> 20 kilometers every weekend yeah. and like really fucking my body. So, so is that, so it's a form of addiction really, isn't it? Because yeah. like, I obviously sure. I have that with me and my addiction that I had and how mm -hmm. I came out of it. But when, once you're an addict, you're always an addict. Mm -hmm. It's just, you just learn to control it and yeah. know that it's not going to come around the corner and bite you on the ass basically. Yeah. And so hitting it really hard and fast is like yeah. just going, right, I'm just going to go hammer and tongue of that. Yeah. And I do. Do you manage to peel away back from it? Can you so, do anything for yourself that says, you know what, actually, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z because I yeah. know I'm going yeah. full pelt? So I do. I wish I could say I have this amazing meditation practice or uh, some super spiritual way of grounding myself. I do not. I am trying to do more yoga. This is a purely also like to stretch my body out because I run a lot and I do a lot of exercise. Um, so I do, I think having just come out of this COVID period, I was bed bound for a couple of days and I never take sick days really. And I never stop really. <laughs> and actually I spent those four days reading voraciously because I felt really ill. I didn't really work. And it was kind of amazing because I think it was, it was quite literally my body saying like, stop, you're pushing me too hard. You're doing too much. And it was such a reminder I think I needed because you know you can go you can do your sex therapy you can proselytize about the importance of having a positive relationship to your body all you like but you can it's really easy to 
that get like you have your moments of just you get lost in work you get lost in the daily rhythms of your life and you know I put a lot of pressure on myself as I know all of us do and it was kind of a reminder for my body like you need to your body was telling you yeah, well you need to honor like what you're saying you're saying like yeah. you're, you know you're telling everyone else to have a good relationship with the body like stop and, chill, and chill out chill out so I try and do more like hot yoga and stuff to try okay. and like, be like stretch a little bit <clears throat> do you find that so you're obviously driven obviously yeah. and we can I can tell that immediately <laughs> even from the moment we got in the car when we were talking and even on email because you've got I've got this this coming up yeah. I've got to do this and like I guess like in this industry or being in this creative world mm-hmm. that we are in at what point does your brain does your brain ever switch off even when you go to sleep how does it is there any moment where you're like okay I feel mm-hmm. really relaxed like my um my sponsor used to say to me, all I want in life, Billy, is I want to be able to put my head down on a pillow mm. and have peace. Mm. Do you find that? I do sleep well. I do. I mean, I have mad dreams, but I do I do sleep very happily. <laughs> and as soon as my head fits a pillow, I am out. Um, but I know, I think that, I think when you're, when you run your own business or when you can work for yourself, you're, it's really, really hard to not be thinking about your business, about your career more broadly all the time because you're so, you train yourself to constantly be on the lookout for opportunities, to be, you're constantly hustling. And I think it does mean like every, you know, every event I go to in the evening, every, you know, everything is about, okay, you know, how can I like, meet this person and then hopefully get them to like come onto sex talks or you know, maybe we can collaborate on this or whatever. So you're kind of constantly in this like pitching mode. And I find it really hard to get out of that. And, but to counter that, I think I, I turned 30 recently and I think I've always been in like kind of mental, like overdrive of like thinking, thinking, overthinking everything and being like, okay, next move, what's going to happen here? And I do feel more as I get a bit older, I feel aware that that's kind of an unsustainable way of being and as much as I care about work and I really want to do my best in everything I work on and I really want to continue to grow sex talks and grow my broadcasting career and and do all of that I don't want to do it at the expense of my mental health at the expense of things that I think when I was a bit younger I was a bit more flippant about like being quite dispensable with and I think now I like I love I mean, I, I said before, I'm, I go to Lisbon a lot. Like I love like long like cycle rides there. I love, you know, reading my book in a cafe. There's more to life than just working, which is never something <laughs> I thought I would ever say. And I think if younger me could hear me say that, they'd be a bit like, oh my God, you're getting lazy. And it's not laziness. It's not. It's just realizing that life has so many layers and you as an individual have so many layers. And also from a creative perspective, you are, you know, creativity doesn't just come from sitting from a laptop and just working, getting your head down. It doesn't at all. It comes from reading. It comes from, my best ideas come when I go on like a long walk, when I read a book. And it's such an obvious cliche thing to say, but it's so true. And I think the moments I feel most like, ah, are when I've just been sitting at my desk all day, like a 12 hour day. And I probably haven't been that efficient in that. And so I'm really trying to kind of shift my mindset to be more, more exploratory and more like what are the other aspects of my life that I want to cultivate that I want to nourish that I want to be big parts of my life because invariably like that you know that helps with everything else that helps bolster my creativity if you could sort of Mm. I don't know like sometimes it's it's easier to for me when I'm thinking about where do I want to be if Mm. I could clap my hands and go right you're going to be at that point that you want to be at yeah how would you what would that look like and how would you think you'd get there because is is it just work? Because it's not just yeah. work anymore. Like you said, you've hit yeah. a certain point and you're like, okay, I want more out of life. I still mm-hmm. want to be successful, but I now need to find more balance or like the equilibrium of, of life. How do you, what does that look like? And how do you, yeah. how do you, how would you envision that? How do you get to that point? How would someone that's listening to this go, oh, okay, so she would do it like this. So how would I do it? How would I get to that point of happiness where it's, I can work hard. I can live, I can play hard if I want to play hard, but I can do things that are not just work driven because work is so, when you, like you said, when you're on your own and you're driving to go somewhere, your pe- your foot's on the pedal and you're just mm-hmm. going, but all of a sudden you take your foot off and you're like, okay, I want more. Mm. How would you get to that point and what would you use? So I vision board quite a bit, which I do find helpful in clarifying what it is that I want because I have 
found this to be my perennial road bump throughout the course of my career. Um, And that is defining what it is that I really want because I want so much and I get a little bit overwhelmed by the all the things I want to achieve and all the things I want to and I definitely think I remember when I was like 10 years old people at school would be like what do you want to be when you're old and I'd be like I want to be a director an actor a writer a doctor and I'd list like 10 things and they'd be like you can't be all those things and I would be so confused I'd be like why why can't I live all these many lives and I think in some respects being work myself I've been always freelance running my own businesses it's you do get to wear all these hats because because you are taking all these different jobs but you can't I do believe that you can't do everything all at once and it's a thing that continues to trip me up to this day and I'm literally I've just finished my vision board the other day because I need I realized I was like okay you've got so many things so many projects you want to work on so many things going through your mind you're not necessarily being super clear on like what is the order of priority you need to do them in so to go back to your question in terms of thinking about like a kind of process for Uh, defining what I want and what I think I don't know if I could say like what I think will make me happy in in 10 years time because I really don't know and I actually think there's too much pressure on this like five-year 10-year plan I personally really struggle with that as an as a concept I really don't know what my life will look like then and I don't I'm like kind of why should I like I I've never really worked like that but I do think it's helpful having a kind of visual representation of things that that at least right now feel right for you and so I do a vision board I mean the the, the day actually the first time on Pinterest and I found it really helpful so I've never done it on Pinterest before but just visually being able to see all these representations of things that bring me joy and whether that's like works I had like the BBC I always wanted to be a BBC broadcaster and I'm doing bits at the moment and I want to continue pursuing that and you know, we the BBC on that, but had like pictures of Lisbon and a gorgeous like European apartment. And it's just like looking at all these things, like books, you know, one of, one of kids, just seeing it and like noting how I felt in looking at these mm. images was really helpful and being like, okay, this, this collection of images makes you feel really good and excited about life and excited and happy. And it's not, it wasn't all just work, you know, there were lots of work elements to it. But there was also, you know, it was the other stuff. It was sunshine. It was, you know, living in, in a foreign country. I definitely want to move away again. You know, it was loads of stuff like pictures of bikes and pictures of runners and all this sort of stuff. And it's, I think it's just important to like note how, as you think about what potential paths lie ahead of you and different things you want to explore, it's just noting how they make you feel. And that's an exercise Sharmadine Reed actually runs a stack. She does a kind of vision mapping workshop at the beginning of every year. And she said, it's really easy to focus on like the material items. So like, okay, I want to earn this amount of money because I want to get this car. I want to own this house. And it's, you know, it's helpful to have financial like metrics of success. So it's definitely a good one way of measuring your progress as your career prog- as your career develops. But she's always like, you need to think like, when you, when you think about yourself and just like maybe it's three months time or one year's time, how do you feel when you imagine yourself doing this? How do you, what, how do you want to feel? How do you want to feel with this perspective potential future partner how you want to feel when you think of yourself you know writing that book or going into that broadcasting studio and I think it's a good way of trying to like tap into like trying to remove that ego so rather than like I want to do all these things I want to like have the car the money the name it's like you know how do you want to feel and then it kind of helps you kind of map out those next steps yours is done through feeling and pictures and images and yeah, I like it that. Is at the I moment. like that. <laughs> no, I like, but I like that idea of it. In my, in my, in my no, I mean, I was uh, listening to a podcast, and uh, you know, she, uh, someone was saying it's uh, the things that cause you friction you need to yeah. remove, and the things that make you happy mm-hmm. you need to create a list, and then yeah. you get rid of the things that cause you friction, and you work on the things that you enjoy. Yeah. Hence, doing this podcast, like, because yeah. I was like, okay, I think I'm going to enjoy doing this, mm-hmm. so I, I took it, I put it into the right section, and yeah. I started working on it. But it's interesting to see that you do it visually. Some people do it. Um, I, I was speaking to someone and and uh, she likes to just sit and meditate and see what comes in and what goes mm, out. And I like then that. she then says, oh, I think I'm going to go this way mm. for a bit. So I like, I, I'm very much an active, like a doer. I find like I think best in motion. I like, if I'm just meditating, I'm like, my mind wanders. Whereas if I'm, it, whether it's even just like walking or, or putting together pictures, like my, it just, my mind goes like. You're more visual. Yeah, I'm, 100%. So uh, I find that and. Helpful. So books, yes, obviously are a big part of your life and yes. reading. And I, I get the feeling that they probably take you on a journey somewhere. Yeah. That you can be in that book literally, yeah. like 
inside the book. Mm-hmm. I used to read only nonfiction because I felt that I needed to always be getting smarter. And the only way to get smarter was through reading nonfiction books that were hard and serious about politics and the issues that I cared about because then I'd have all these talking points at dinner parties and blah, blah, blah. But I found, I found the like process of, and there are some nonfiction books that are amazing and I've loved. And I think, you know, I actually just recently read Hatchy Twitter, which is such a good business book, but it's written as if it's fiction, but obviously it's about the story of the origin story of Twitter. So it's a really good business book because it's written as though it's like a kind of murder mystery. So it's, it's kind of the, un, the dramatic unfolding of what were crazily dramatic events as Twitter evolved over the years. But it was, it was a thoroughly enjoyable book, but I have really started reading more fiction because I think... I'm looking for that escapism and I think I used to think that that escapism was bad because these fictitious worlds were like what am I learning from fictitious worlds I should be learning about this world but you learn so much through fiction expands your mind you tap into feelings you tap into like you can learn so much from brilliantly written fiction pieces so I think I really relish that opportunity I think also I I am someone that is kind of perennially dissatisfied with what I'm doing. I am always looking at, and it's, and it's a bad thing. It's a good thing. It it keeps me motivated and moving forward and pushing myself. But I think sometimes it also makes me feel, um, I get a bit too hung up on like the, the, what you could be doing. The grass is always greener and that's not always helpful, but I find reading is amazing solace in those moments of feeling deep dissatisfaction when it doesn't feel like it's not doesn't feel like a good like motivating time for dissatisfaction because reading allows me to live all the lives I feel like I might not get to live in this lifetime because as I said you can't do it all at once I can't right now I need to be in London I'm focusing on I've got quite a few work projects going on like I'm stuff's going well sex talks I need to be in London right now I can't realistically move somewhere else but I can read about people living in glorious other countries and I can lead that life through like very carelessly through them and so reading for me has always been like that is that tool for allowing me to yeah, to explore a different dimension, a different world that maybe right now I can't step into. Just basically, it helps you get away. Yeah. Dig Ultimate in, escapism. Turn off. Exactly. And and so when you read, do you read pretty quick? You know, or I actually, Or are you just sort depends. of like trying to take it in? Yeah, it depends. If I'm reading a really, really well-written good bit of fiction, I can, I can read really fast. So I can like finish a book in a day and be like, when I was sick with COVID, I just read, I just, I imbibed the books. I know, I think, I know I, I always feel like it's a really... I feel like I've been caught in a fishing line. When I have a book that I'm just so immersed and I can't put it down, I then will just like power through it. But if I if I get like if it's a hard book that I'm kind of like trudging through, so I feel like I should read it. it. No, I'm not a slow reader. So you spoke about COVID a lot. Yeah. So was it? Did you have a bad bout of it? Was it quite intense? It was. Uh, yeah, it was. Quite, I was I had a really bad like neck and back injury alongside having COVID. So I just my body just felt broken. So I just needed to like recuperate for a yeah for a week. And now you've sort of come out of it. You're yeah. like, okay, I need to put my foot back on the pedal, full yeah, on. Or I do. I do. Or are you? <laughs> or you're just like? <laughs> no, I do. You have. Yeah. No, I have. Um, it's been yeah, yeah. It was only it was about like two weeks ago, I think. And I mean, not to like go on about fucking COVID because, but long COVID is kind of a thing. I do feel like it does like slightly flatten you. It kind of, it is so tiring, but I, yeah, back on it. I've got, pl- I've got lo- big plans for sex talks at the moment. I'm hoping taking sex talks to America, to New York and hopefully LA, taking to Edinburgh Fringe Festival, uh, taking, doing loads of pop-ups coming up. So I need to just like really focus in on, on getting stuff planned. And yeah. when you're that focused, does it allow you to, to take other things into your life? Yeah, I So definitely... are you able to like, you know, if someone comes along and says, oh, do you know what? I really like you. Why don't we do this? Or why don't we go here? Can you drop the ball on that a little bit? Or are you so focused that... I used to not be, I think, um, in that I would be... Sorry, I used to be really, like, one-track minded. But I didn't think it was, like... I didn't really... It wasn't that that healthy or helpful. Now I... I'm, yeah, super exploratory and curious and can definitely be distract. I'm actually... I think... That a kind of slight negative side of it, I'm super distractible. I have such a like magpie kind of vibe. So if I'm not in like a deep, or I find deep work hard. And if I'm not in a deep work mode, I am like my eyes flitting. So yes, I definitely can be. Led this and you've always street. been in East London, you said as well. No, so I actually, so I grew up, well, I was born in New York, but grew up in South East London and then okay. moved to East London. And, yeah, and where in ago. South East London were you? Uh, I grew up in Lewisham. Okay. Actually. And what, um, when you were in Lewisham, because Lewisham's quite different. 
Like, it is quite different. I remember it from a certain age. Yeah. It was pretty intense around in Lewisham. It's been intensely gentrified in the last few years. I don't recognise it. When I go back to my parents' house, they live in Blackheath now, but yeah, it's very, very different than it, when it was growing up. I'm just trying to understand more. So you're doing all your sex talk stuff, and mm. that's a big part of your life. Mm. Is there anything else that you say, this is also a really big part of my life, and this is what I do? Like, what makes you tick? like it's not just obviously sex talks is your business you love yeah. it it's helped you it's helped you kind of def it just defined you in the sense that it's fixed stuff that you had going on but what else defines you what else gives you the drive to get up and go i mean genuinely i really really do love exercise it sounds like boring but i'm like i've got like a couple of half marathons coming up i uh do you have a charity that you run I, for or? no i actually just started joining a running group though i run with the um your friendly runners in east london who okay. i love and that's been a really nice way i think of also i think post post pandemic i've really sought to cultivate more community in my life i think i as i said i work alone quite a lot and i think that more and more now and i think we're seeing this like kind of across the board there is more of an onus on community finding community and finding that kind of nourishment in more like i guess like localism and so i recently joined a running group which i love and i got like so obsessed with to the point where i kind of got injured but now i'm going back i love my running group um but really looking for more opportunities to yeah to have that kind of community and have that feeling of being supported by others i guess in in everything i'm doing with work um yeah and then like i've and I travel a lot I love going I mean I love exploring new countries I love um I spend quite a lot of time in Lisbon as I mentioned remote working just because I love being able to have that I mean I am lucky with what I do I can just take my laptop and be writing an article or, or planning sex talks or whatever it may be and then you know grab a bike and we can go on a long biking mm -hmm. tour with a group I meet there so I really try and get away if I can like once a month leave London and go somewhere new and try and explore somebody somewhere else so I take a lot of joy in travel. Is there a place that you'd like to go that you haven't been is there oh, like oh my tons. god there's like here's my top three that i must do oh my god i wanted to say japan but i feel like everyone on hinge is like i really want to go to japan and <laughs> I'm out here, I'm like, oh god i just become this like walking talking cliche but i mean so japan but like don't don't hate on me for being a hinge cliche um yeah japan i, want to go. I really want to go to nashville with my dad my dad's really into country western music and okay. I he goes to the Nashville Country Music Awards like very regularly, <laughs> and I feel aware. My parents are older. My parents are they'll hate me for saying this, like late sixties, early seventies, and I feel our relationship has got so much better as I've got older, and I we have such a like tightly knit crew and my family me my sister my mom my dad are so close now i said to my dad the other day i was like you are a much better parent to an adult than you were to a child which he was not happy with <laughs> but i was like you wouldn't you're a workaholic you were like never really there and you had you kind of kind of angry quite a lot it seemed whereas now he's like my it sounds like so corny but my family are like my best friends like i have best friends outside of my family but i happily live with my two best friends but my family really are that my relationship has changed with them a lot and i think i feel very aware of like how precious the time i have with them is now mm. especially as they get older um so i i think the traveling being i like going with my family i went recently went to zimbabwe well not well a couple years ago went to zimbabwe which is where my dad grew up actually he grew up in well it was then bulawayo and he gave me this like tour of his his home his where he'd you know his, his dad had passed away when he was there he had you know his so much of his identity was is so fundamentally rooted in Zimbabwe and I'd never been so like going to that and getting to kind of see the what makes him tick and who he is was really special so I'm trying to do more of that kind of travel do you lean on your parents for advice? oh my god I lean <laughs> on my parents so much my poor mother has a like breakdown call so regularly of like mom I can't do it it's really hard my business or like mom who am I what am I doing and she is and my sister as well my sister and I speak like pretty much every day or or every other day and Actually, my sister's an amazing, she's an actress and she's such an amazing, um, she just has such a creative, incredible mind and is so, she's able to disent to like detangle when your mind get you know, when your mind just gets like a little bit, like gets all tangled up and you're like, you can't really see through and see 
what it is you're really, what the problem you're facing really is. And you get overwhelmed by everything. My sister is so good at being so like, okay, let's break this down. So you're panicking about this, but actually like, you know, you've got this, this, and just helping you. I, she really helps me go like step by step through whatever like existential crisis with, with business or work or life or boys or whatever I'm going through. And say my mom's really, really good with that as well. My parents are also writers. So my mum have been, has been amazing with, uh, like she will read through my articles, which are increasingly about sex, which I find like my mom's like, oh gosh, another piece about kink. And I'm like, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I lean on them a lot. And so you also lean on your friends. Yeah. And how, what does that look like? Like when you're feeling that moment yeah. where you're a bit like, where well, we all get it, where it's that, oh my God, is this actually yeah. worth it? Am I doing the right thing? Yeah. S- self-doubt. Oh my God, self-doubt. Tell I, me about the self-doubt and how you actually then yeah. start to, A, realize you're having that moment. Yeah. We can get lost in it. Yeah. Uh, does it last long or do you like, okay, I'm actually feeling self-doubt. I, I can see something's happening mm. here. I'm not going to reach out. What, what do you do when you reach out? You know, it's, I've been thinking about this a lot recently because I really, I think, I wish I could say this wasn't the case, but I do think we all should talk about this a bit more openly. I would say it's like the biggest struggle I have with my work is the self-doubt I feel so constantly with working for myself and not having the like built-in legitimacy that one has when they belong to a big company that mm. itself kind of creates the legitimacy and you, know, you say you work at Google people get what Google is they they're like oh wow you know and I think you're constantly when you run a business you're in business you're constantly having to pitch that business anyway because you're trying constantly trying to get people to give you money for this or do that or like pitching ideas which in itself like you know takes a lot from you but you're also having to main keep up the momentum of your own belief in your in the what it is you're doing and also your capacity to do it and i really don't want to sugarcoat it that's the thing i find it really difficult and there are so many especially recently i think you know in the past um you know like few months it's something I really struggled with I I found myself increasingly being like can I do this I find the work on my own really difficult and I think we really glamorize the life like the founder I remember before I um when I was still working at Sky News like a couple years ago I was so enamored by you know we'd have these people come on I'd book guests to to speak on the show on whatever show I was working on and they'd be like founder of this and founder of that and I'd be so enamored by that and I'd be like it's so cool like they run their own business and I did I was like I want that I want that I want that and I hadn't really thought what that actually meant and I didn't I was bedazzled by the impression I had of of what it of like someone just being like running their own thing and in many ways it is incredible it gives you so much freedom it's so I love I feel so proud of having created something out of nothing something that wasn't there and then I like I look around at my events when I host an event I'm like I this I this has all happened because I had an idea and I I made it into something and I did it on my own and the same with like building a community around sex talks around her hustle my previous company I can build communities that I feel so proud of but the in between the reality the in between of that is is loneliness and it is uh that self-doubt that paralyzing self-doubt and I think you asked what I what I find the kind of the most effective I guess coping mechanisms for that and I mean apart from first of all they're like obligatory existential call to my mom to be like I can't do it it's impossible and then she's like okay well it's not impossible because you've done it up to this point you can do it but I think definitely leaning on having people like working in uh the space that I'm in so like I other I mentioned Billy Quinlan who runs Furley she's a very good friend of mine and I've been really privileged to get to meet lots of incredible founders uh kind of working a lot like sexual wellness industry but and, and beyond and a lot through Charmaine actually he's also a good friend and I think that has been so invaluable because you can share in the highs and the lows because that's the thing when you run mm. your own thing the highs are so high I'll be I'll have like a great day get sponsorship for something get a new opportunity come through and I'm like I am living my goddamn dream and I did this myself and I am just a queen boss bitch and no one can put me down and then the next day I'm like I know I feel I don't know how to I, it can be something as small as like I don't know how to start my day because I don't know how to prioritize what tasks I have and I feel and then I you know, feel worried about money on on one project or something and I have this like spiral and I'm like oh my god this is terrible <laughs> so the highs and lows are so profound but I think yeah having that like those people who have who are in a similar position and who understand those highs and lows is so so helpful who you can also walk through quite pragmatically and also sometimes the answer is like okay if you if it becomes like if for example you're I spoke to Billy about this the other day we're like rather than that immediately jumping to 
can the whole thing. You can't do it, which obviously your mind goes to sometimes because when things get hard. Meltdown. The meltdown, exactly. But like, okay, so what is working? What do I find is really working? And then you said, what is that? Like, gain that friction. Where are the, where are they like the strong points? So for me, I'd be like, okay, the event's going really well. I love interviewing people. I absolutely love, I love the research around it. I love getting to work with amazing brands who I think are super cool. I love working with media stuff. Okay, so make that list of all the things. These are things that are going well and I feel proud of and I'm positive. And then write this, okay, what are the challenges and faces? So right now I'll be feeling lonely in what I'm doing. Um, feeling like I don't have like proper like, mentorship and or like kind of someone or so a few people around me who I can really like learn from in cl- close proximity. Uh, you know, wanting to maybe make a bit more money in something. And you put that list down and be like, okay, cool. How do I but bring those things, address those challenges within the context of what I'm currently doing rather than feeling that like, you know, that existential angst that leads to think I shouldn't be doing this at all. And I think for a long time, I really, I've always been freelance or run my own business. And I've, for a long time, I've always, I've often, I've tended to think, oh, if only I like, I just need to go and get a real job, whatever that means, and work in a company. <laughs> and I think what that ignores is that like, it's really like things within me that I just need to like sort out. And like, there's there's ways of being less lonely in my job for like, for example, working more with like, I just did something for BBC and I loved working with the team there. Just do more of that. You know, you want mentorship, get mentors, like reach out to people, like make a list. I've just actually the other day made a list of the people whose, whose careers I really admire. And I'm reaching out to all of them. Like, could we grab a coffee or like have a phone call for 20 minutes? I love what you're doing. I'm inspired by you. It's sometimes I think problems can feel so... Like they can feel like these behemoth, like monstrous things because you just, because that's like you're worried, you're anxious or whatever. But actually oftentimes you break them down and you isolate what's really making you feel um, lost or frustrated or anxious. It's then much easier to combat those things and to, yeah, to overcome them. Right. Because that's what I want people to realize that yeah. it can be like, it, it is high and it is low. Oh, so high, so low. But if you once you start to to put things down on a bit of paper yeah. or segment them and push them around, you can then actually focus on the good bits. Yes, As exactly. well as going, okay, those things are causing me some yeah. problems. I'm going to have to address them. And then you also use sport. Yeah, for sure. You use your friends and your family. Yeah. You lean on them. Have and a book club because you, I'm a super nerd. <laughs> and you read. Yeah. And so you do all these little things yeah. that help control your, your mental health, which ultimately the stronger we are, like the old saying you know it is a cliche you know health is wealth uh, it does matter and as you get older you can't just keep pushing there's a saying you can't work sometimes you can't work harder you've just got to work smarter, smarter. oh my god yes that was my kind of mantra at the beginning of the year is i don't want to work harder i want to work much much smarter and i think as you get older i think you realize as well that it's i'm not willing to sacrifice everything i was willing to sacrifice maybe when i was younger for the sake of what i perceive to be success and I think that's a really important point to address and it's something I've been thinking about a lot recently is like what does success actually look like to me because I think especially with my first business I was really I'd read all these business books I was working in a we work at the time like in a co-working space we work and I was really starry-eyed by all these businesses around me everyone's talking about how much they money they'd raised how much what their like you know 10x growth foresight was for uh, forecast were for the business and and imbibing books like zero to one and all these business thing and I was like adopting this business language I didn't really understand what I was talking about <laughs> at all but I was like adopting this language and this mindset and me and my old co- co-founder would would sit together and be like we want with her hustles as creative production agency we want global expansion we want to have a team of hundreds we want to be big and bad and better and blah blah, blah. and I didn't really think I didn't actually really know what that would entail I don't think I really wanted that either I've never I had a coffee with someone yesterday who was telling me about his business which has done very very well and he was saying you know I've always he asked me he's like what do you want from what you're doing and I was like <laughs> he was like because growing up I always wanted to run a big business I wanted to have a big team around me I did I wanted to make a I, he was like I wanted to make a billion pound business he's like I didn't make a billion pound one but he did a very good business and he was like that's always been that's always what I wanted and I had to take a step back and be like well that's not what I wanted and it, it, it never was I never I don't I don't really like managing people like I'm not very good at it and the thought of having this kind of huge team team that I am responsible for like gives me extreme anxiety and is not necessarily what I would like find fulfilling I don't want a big business and I think it's easy to get caught up in the in other people's idea 
and ideas of success and to then internalize them and compare yourself and your progress in relation to these externally imposed mm. ideas of success. And so after my, so after when her hustle, we kind of, sex talks has really come out of her hustle because it was the stuff I was doing before, like running events, creating podcasts, creating um, digital content, which I was doing with her hustle. I'm doing with sex talks now, but it's, it's focused on, it's kind of moved the dial a little bit. So more fo- focused on sex, um, intimacy and gender. But I think it was a really big learning curve for both, for both me and my um, former business partner to really focus in and spend time thinking about what we actually wanted from what we're creating. She actually runs a different business now too. And I think the way we run our respective businesses is very different the way we ran her hustle and the way we approached it. Because we realized we were like, and she says it off to me now, she's like, you know, people tell me, you know, my she owns a, um, a publicity business. I could do, you know, can grow by 10, tenfold this year. Da, da, da. And she's like, I don't want that. I want to work with the artists I work with. I want to create a publishing arm. So she, she, we're much more confident in being firm with what we actually want versus what other people's expectations of us might be. And I think it's just really, really important to always kind of come back to that question of what you really want from whatever it is you're working on. How do you get that clarity? Do you write it down? It's a really good question. I really wish I could find out because last yesterday <laughs> when he said, question. you know what, actually I'm fresh out of this great coffee with this amazing um, guy yesterday who said he runs, um, it was just exited actually a very successful business. And, and I said, I know he asked me the question, like, what do you actually want from, from sex talks and what you're doing now? Like, where do you want, where do you want it to go? Because that's really the, the, at the heart of, you know, your digital growth strategy and your uh, US growth. I like at the heart of all of that is where are you mm. taking this? And I began to be like, well, you know, on this, blah, blah, blah. and I had to stand back and be like, in all honesty, I find that question the hardest one to answer. I've always found it really difficult to answer. Like, what do you want? Because suddenly it feels like this big existential question of like, what do you want your life to look like? Who do you want to be? And these are big, heavy existential questions. And it changes. One day I want to be a fucking like, you know, superstar broadcaster. And the next day I'm like, oh no, I do really want to create some sort of business and education platform. And I want to be an author and I want all these things. And again, you can do a lot of that stuff, but not all in the same go. So what he said to me, and I found it really consoling, was like, okay, if you find it really overwhelming, if, if it doesn't work for you to think like that, if, if ultimately every time you confront that question, you are flummoxed by it and you are anxious and it doesn't, it doesn't lead to anything. It, it's not a good question. Don't bother. It's not working. Instead, think in quarters. And he said when he first started his business, he would uh, think in terms of like, he'd set kind of, well, like kind of quarterly goals uh, in relation to like when his needs at that time. So he'd be like, right, okay, first I said, I need to make enough money out of this business right now for me to move out my mom's house. Cool, he did that. Okay, now I need to make enough bus- enough money in the business so that I can hire three creatives who will help me get brand deals. Okay, cool, so he moves to that. And he said it just kind of broke down the mm. bigger problem, like the bigger problem to be solved through the business. And I think it was really comforting to me to hear someone who has grown a multi-million pound business say that because I think, Sometimes I do think there's a lot of pressure on all of us to have these very well articulated big life visions and big business plans. And yes, that is can you know be important, but if you are not able to think like that, which I definitely am not, that's also okay, but like find the methodology that works for you. So for me, I can very clearly say I when I break up my year into quarters, I can do that. 4 months doesn't seem so like is it three months? Three months. Three months. <laughs> three months. Oh, even better. <laughs> Only three months. I can think, I'm like, in three months, I know what I want to do. I want to, you know, I want to, I won't go through my to-do list now, but it gives me, it feels achievable. It doesn't feel big. And I think I go back to that thing of the burden of those big existential questions of who do I want to be and how do I want to live my life? They're, I think they can actually make you make bad decisions or at least not live very well in the present so I lived in New York for a while when I was in my mid-20s I was working as a producer for Tina Brown's media company and I was a freelancer there and the freelancing gig came to an end but I wanted to stay in New York but rather than just thinking about okay what would I love like my next like year in New York to look like I really did I got very very caught up in the bigger questions of like do I want to be in New York forever do I want to you know uh, work in politics or and I got and it and it really tripped me up and it meant I didn't really make the most of being in New York the whole time and I ended up coming kind of 
flip-flopping and kind of coming back to the UK to work at Sky News for a bit, which was, you know, they're all great opportunities. But I just, I was so anxious at the time. I wish I could just go back to my like mid-20 self and be like, chill the fuck out, Percy, because you're so anxious about everything. It's not worth the worry. And second of all, like you can just do New York for a year. It doesn't need to be that. You don't need to be able to imagine your family and your grandkids and everything in New York. And like, you know, the progression <laughs> of your career in X, Y, and Z. You can just enjoy it for now and be like, right now, it feels super exciting to be in a new city, learning, meeting new people. That's enough, okay? You could do, think about when, and look around who is doing interesting things who you feel inspired by. Don't overcomplicate it. And I think, yeah, so I guess if I, you didn't ask this question, but I'm gonna ask it of myself and answer it. <laughs> The best advice I can give to like my I was about to say, what is yeah, the, best the best advice? advice. But it's fine. You, we First got one, there. It ain't that deep. Like, don't overthink everything. And just, it's so much better to put one foot in front of the other and just move forward. And enjoy than the to moment. Get stuck in that stagnant place of mm. being worried about the bigger existential questions and worried about where your life's going to go, worried about who you're going to be. Just be like, what will get me? to my next step right now like what can i do today that will help me make one put one foot in front of the other then you get to that point you say okay cool now i'm here now what is that next step i need to take and i think again i guess what all the like underlying theme that really runs through i guess everything i've been saying is just breaking down those bigger challenges in ways that feels like the challenge feels surmountable um and then I would also say to my younger self, also consistency is key. If you commit to something, there is no right or wrong path. And that's the thing, like much like, you know, echoing what I've said, like there's not a right way to live your life. There's not a right way to design your career. There's not a right person to be with. Like the, things can feel right now, but you know, you might, you could have also done something else and it would have also been really good. Yeah. And you could have married someone else. You might also have been really happy with them. Like you don't, there's no one right way to live your life. And so I think that rather than getting kind of weighed down by the like, but is this the, definitely a hundred percent the right decision? Think like, yeah, just get to that next step and be consistent to it. Just commit to the decision and be consistent with it. And then reevaluate. So like in a year's time, okay, cool. So I've done this for a year is this where I want to be? Do I want to keep on this path? And if the answer is no, okay. But you've got experience, you've built something and then you move on. But I think, yeah, don't, it ain't that deep. Okay, I'm conscious of time because I know that you've got a... Oh God, yes. You've got the time. Call yeah. Up. So I'm going to, I want to... We talk forever. <laughs> literally, I think we could be here for yeah. a while. Mm. And I think that represents really what your character is <laughs> and what's been good today. Talking. <laughs> talking, sex talking, uh, but just talking generally. Yeah. And I think today it's been good for us to understand a little bit more about your thought process mm. and what, what you do and what you go through. And also like there's been some key things that we can pull out mm. and hopefully that will give people some inspiration mm. when they're struggling and they're not getting on and they don't think it's going right mm -hmm. or it's going well to keep their feet on the ground yeah. and just literally, like you said, take one step at a time, don't rush, enjoy the moment because yeah, we do moment. live thinking about we're never present. We're either behind us or in front yeah. of us and we need to be to be present. Yeah, and if you're always thinking about your life, and I think that is part of, we live in a very success-driven society and I think social media plays such a huge role in this. And I'm, I I don't want to shit on social media too much because I do think, you know, for me, it's so great. It's an asset to my work. I, I book guests through social media. I, you know, meet amazing people through social media. But what I would say is that we are overexposed to other people, constantly overexposed to other people's successes all the time. So you wake up in the morning, you have a quick scroll on Instagram and immediately you've seen 20, um, 100 examples of like the best bits of other people's lives, which I think just puts this pressure on us to, to like, we need to be living all these like perfect that, lives. That probably this, isn't perfect right behind not, the back of it. It's not perfect. Nothing also, is like, perfect And also it. I think it's kind of that, there's a really great um, passage um, in Sylvia Plath's book. I think it was in the bell jar, but it might've been something else. But anyway, it's about this woman who's sitting underneath a um, fig tree and she's looking up at the figs and she can't decide which fig to pick. And she's just looking and she's looking and she can't decide. And she's overwhelmed. She can't pick the fig. She doesn't pick the fig. She keeps stalling. She's like, but what is the best fig? And it's just looking and looking and looking. And the figs begin to um, shrivel up and they begin to drop off and they've shriveled and they've died and there's no more figs. And the point of the story <laughs> is that you, if you stall and stop and don't make a decision, you don't get the good juicy fig. And I think sometimes when we spend all our time looking left and right, like through social media and looking at these little vignettes of other people's lives, we don't pick our own fig and just 
pick our own pick your own lane and pick your own fig and just stick to it and be happy and and try and be happy in that moment because like things are fleeting and also you said health as wealth early like it really is and I've had friends recently have had like really big health crisis happen and it's put so much into perspective of like you can't it's really easy to take those things for granted and to assume like you can always have your foot on this accelerator and be going 100 miles per hour and that's why it's okay if you're miserable now because you're going to be okay and relax one day like no you need to be able to enjoy your life now and enjoy enjoy the fruits of your labor otherwise what's the point i think that is the perfect way to end it great amazing thank you very much thank you for having me